The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is as enduring as it is symbolically charged. The recent political upheavals, especially in Egypt and now in Syria, have turned our attention away from this David and Goliath battle, where both sides claim to be David. To help us understand the different shades of this Palestinian narrative, we're joined tonight by, in London, UK, via Skype, Ala Tartir. He is program director of Al Shabaka, the Palestinian Policy Network. He's also a PhD candidate at the London School of Economics. In Berkeley, California, George Bisharat, professor of law at the University of California, Hastings College of the Law. In Washington, D.C., via Skype, Hussein Ibish, senior fellow at the American Task Force on Palestine. And in New York, New York, Samar Badawi, a writer and Middle East analyst. And we are grateful for all four of you being on our program tonight. We thank you for your participation. I want to start, and Hussein, I'll start with you, since one of the people working in your city has been logging an awful lot of frequent flyer mileage lately, traveling to the region in search of peace. I'd like to ask you about the American Secretary of State, John Kerry, and whether you think, through all of his travels, he's moved the yardsticks forward at all on the Israel-Palestine problem. Um, well, he's, he's certainly generated a lot of motion, and um, we don't know anything uh, concrete about the consultations that have gone on, um, what exactly he's trying to put together. We've heard talk of a framework. We've heard talk of guidelines. Um, it's not clear what exactly um, this is going to be. It's, it's almost more clear what it's not going to be, which is a kind of uh, an American diktat uh, to the parties about what the final status ought to look like. Um, and I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's if, if any such thing comes uh, to pass, and I think probably more likely to than not, though we don't know, um, it'll probably be pretty vague on some key areas, and the parties will have, in all likelihood, reservations either published or an, a new kind of interesting twist, unpublished, as, as it was in Northern Ireland, uh, reservations. Samir Badawi, how do you see the Kerry peace mission working so far? Well, I think the key point, Steve, is that uh, the literally one third of the Palestinian population in the occupied territories, which is to say the million and a half plus Palestinians who live in Gaza, uh, not to mention the three quarters of the Palestinian population worldwide uh, that count themselves refugees, have been entirely left out of the process. And so to me, that does not bode well for its success. Left out of the process in what respect? In the sense that uh, Gaza has been left off of the table. Um, uh, the, the better to not deal with the fact that uh, Hamas is in control there. Um, but clearly, any contiguous state um, of Palestine uh, uh, would need to include them, as it would need to include, uh, again, the three quarters of the worldwide Palestinian population who are part of the diaspora and continue to have an international right of return. George Bisharat, how do you see it at the moment? To me, it looks like another nine months of delay, which has only permitted the further entrenching of the, of the Israeli occupation through active settlement building and a variety of other measures that basically curtail Palestinian rights and prevent them from exercising any sort of freedom, uh, building their economy, or, uh, or, or living a normal life. Alat Tartir, your view. Well, for me, from all the reports that we get from the media and the leaks here and there, um, all indicates to a big no, actually, for, for Kerry plan, even, even though we know very little about it. But the leaks are not really uh, a source of optimism. Actually, they are, they are, what, we are what we hear so far are a source of uh, depression, actually, and the, and the, and the misery. So, um, Indeed, uh, so far the framework has to be uh, uh, resisted uh, in order to ensure to ensure peace. What it attempts to do is to sustain the status quo as far as uh, as it appears to be. Hussein, let me follow up uh, in this respect. I know football season's over, but I'm going to use a football metaphor anyway. It seemed that President Obama was content to let Kerry carry the ball and just see how he could do with it. Yeah. Kerry certainly hoped that that represented a new chapter, a new opening, a new sense of possibility in the region. Do you sense that that is actually happening? Um, well, let's put it this way. Um, when, and I think it's an absolutely apt metaphor, uh, President Obama having held the file himself during his first uh, term and not having um, succeeded uh, in uh, making any progress of significance, 
um, has uh, passed the file, has passed the ball to the secretary. And he has taken it up with, I think, greater enthusiasm and greater dynamism than anybody expected. So, you know, the amount of at least sheer energy and determination um, and, and uh, effort um, is impressive. Uh, the other thing that's impressive about it is that he's managed to keep the world's greatest leakers from leaking. Uh, he's been very uh, harsh on people in Washington, uh, among the Israelis and the Palestinians, so that the leaks are coming from people who are tertiary um, uh, and who are clearly spinning things. So we don't really know much about what's going on, and that's very difficult to do. Now, how much progress has he made uh, you know, towards even establishing a framework for future negotiations, which is, which is in the big picture, a modest goal isn't known. And I think it has to be recognized that he comes in with very little to work with here uh, on the Israeli and Palestinian side and without too much support uh, in the rest of the American political scene, which is a sort of, um, a, frankly, has Middle East fatigue. George, let me follow up on the, the Palestinian side of this equation. Uh, in this respect, and sure. I'd like you to follow up on, on a comment that Samer just made a, a little while ago, do you think Mahmoud Abbas has the legitimacy to negotiate on behalf of the entire Palestinian community, if I can put it that way, uh, or are you more in the line of what Summer was saying, namely that all of those who live in Gaza are in essence not represented at these talks? I guess I would put myself in Samer's uh, camp. Uh, you know, it's been a long time since, since Abbas's term as uh, uh, president of the Palestinian Authority has legally expired. His government, arguably, uh, uh, that he appointed uh, after Hamas was elected in 2006, is arguably illegal as well. Um, it, it, you know, uh, Palestinian voices from the outside have had, from the diaspora, have had very few opportunities to actually uh, make themselves heard. Uh, at the Palestinian leadership level. And so I, I think the leadership has been operating for a long time now uh, without a legitimate mandate. Now, uh, I, I believe that it, as, as long as the leadership continues to act in a way that, can, that uh, is perceived widely as serving Palestinian interests, they may still be able to proceed, may still be able to sign an agreement, but the moment at which they deviate from core Palestinian interests then I think that lack of legitimacy will be evident. And I do think that that is likely to occur. Uh, President Abbas's recent statement in a speech to Israeli university students about uh, the, about the uh, not wanting to drown uh, Israel in a sea of re Palestinian refugees indicates that he's willing to surrender significantly on the Palestinian right of return. And I don't think that's going to go over well with the Palestinian po uh, body politic. Uh, quick point, Steve. Can sure, I go ahead. Just very quick, I, I, don't, I can't imagine there's anybody on this panel who isn't aware that it's a, a legal and diplomatic reality that the PLO is the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinians and is the only entity entitled to negotiate on their behalf. So Abbas, <coughs> for all of his problems of everyone not being elected, Hamas as well, uh, is the chair of the PLO. And the PLO has this role and this responsibility. And the international standing of the PLO is one of the few sort of successes of the Palestinian movement uh, in the past 60 years. And so even Hamas recognizes the, the, that the PLO is authorized to negotiate with Israel. You can may cite all the complaints that we just heard and many, many more. There are all kinds of complaints about this leadership and, and uh, about the current policies of the PLO. But the legal right of the PLO to represent the Palestinians, I think, is beyond a challenge. Samer, Samer, let me get you to follow up on that in this regard. Uh, whether, you, whether you think Hamas ought to be at the negotiation table or whether you think they ought not to be at the negotiating table, the reality is they are widely perceived, regardless of what party you belong to in the United States, as being a terrorist organization. And as long as that is the way they're described, there's not much likelihood that they're going to be there. Fair to say? I, I, I think it's fair to say that uh, the PLO is indeed the legitimate representative of the Palestinian people, but I would take issue with what Hussein said, because I don't know the last time that I or my, my parents, for that matter, who are Palestinian refugees from the 1967 war, had the right to vote for who leads us. And, and you know, I, I would question uh, whether or not Mahmoud Abbas has not only the wherewithal, but also um, the intention of ever uh, forging a detente with Hamas. Um, 
which ultimately is the only way forward because no, there is no way to achieve a lasting peace uh, uh, with the Israelis without the consent um, and the full buy-in of 1.7 million people who live in Gaza. Um, you know, Hamas is not the issue here. Hamas is, un unlike, uh, unlike the, P the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank and unlike any of the Arab governments that, uh, that surround it, um, has no control of its borders, has no control of what goes in, what comes out, and cannot stop F-16s when the Israelis decide to bomb, you know, Gaza for nine days straight, as they, as they did in November of 2012, um, just the in, in the last episode. The PA so so who, who would want that job? Um, that, that's the real question for me. Um, so really, if Abbas is interested in reconciliation at, at the Palestinian national level, he should be engaging with Palestinians in Gaza um, writ large, not simply Hamas, but there are, you know, there are youth movements, there are NGOs, there is a civil society that is quite vibrant, that has always been vibrant. He knows this, and he has the opportunity to have that conversation. Uh, Allah, let me bring you in uh, to the conversation at this point by asking you the following. I know you're in London right now studying, but where are you from originally? Uh, originally, I'm um, from Elit, uh, a city occupied um, in, uh, in proper Israel now, uh, and I, I was born and live in Ramallah. So West Bank? Yeah, in the West Bank. Actually, I just came back from, from West Bank uh, two weeks ago. And actually related to the, uh, the genuine fear that I, I felt among so many Palestinians is that they are fearing that uh, Kerry and his plan and the whole new rounds of negotiation can be the biggest sellout after, uh, since Oslo. So echoing the, uh, the voices of the people from, from the ground point out to a, to a problematic issue, in addition to what just Samuel and George added, like there are 11 million, 11 million Palestinians over the world, uh, definitely the PA does not represent them, and the, and the, and the PLO is, uh, I'm not sure what is left actually of the PLO, uh, other, than, other than the name. Uh, there is no effective institutions, as Samuel said, we never elected any, any of uh, any of our representatives there. So there is a legitimacy gap. There is a there is a leadership uh, a leadership gap. So uh, keeping these uh, the, these issues in in mind and and uh, if if Kerry and his plan will bring any source of, of optimism and actually actually why we are why are we expecting a different result if the players are the same and if the rules of the game is still the same as well. The Palestinian negotiators are the same, same negotiators since, since Oslo, more or less. They are, they are following the, the same approach. Uh, the Israeli uh, society keep in electing uh, more right-wing and racist um, uh, governments. Uh, and then we have a problematic issue with the whole framework that is, it, it is exclusively dependent on the dishonest broker for peace, the, the US administration. So, in a way, why, why are we expecting a different result if the same rules are dominating the space? Well, to that end, uh, historians always love to find out whether or not history is repeating itself. And George, let me bring you in to ask you this. Uh, over the past decade or more, we have seen two intifadas, two uprisings. And there are, I guess yes. there's a lot of commentary these days about whether or not we're in the midst of or on the cusp of a third intifada. I gather that um, right. a poll taken for the Arab world for research and development says 60% of Palestinians, quote, predict a fresh wave of anti-Israeli uprising. Based on your knowledge of the situation on the ground, do you think that's true? Well, yes and no. Uh, yes, I think that Palestinians are in a stage of reevaluating a variety of different strategies that can be t deployed uh, to fight for their freedoms and their and their rights. I don't think it will I, I don't think that the Palestinian population in the occupied territories is at this moment poised to uh, to launch an intifada along the lines of either the first or the second one. So I think we're going to be seeing resistance, but I think we're going to be seeing it in new forms and I think we're going to be seeing it in uh, nonviolent forms, in economic forms, in legal forms, in diplomatic forms and the like. that that is what I, uh, here and those are the kinds of discussions that I think many Palestinians are currently engaging in. Hussein, I have to ask the difficult follow-up, which is the cost of the first two uprisings in terms of Palestinian lives, yeah. more than 6,000 dead, yeah. and yet uh, the Palestinian people still do not have their state. My question is, what do you think might be accomplished with a third uprising? 
Well, if it's a violent one, it will be counterproductive, and it, nothing will be accomplished. There will be greater losses. And I, I think I think George is actually right, although we, we may disagree on some details. Um, I think he's absolutely right when he says that there is a, a reevaluation of what kind of strategies can actually move the ball forward. Um, now, in the end, you've got to have negotiations with Israel, because there isn't going to be a Palestinian state. There isn't going to be Palestinian independence without Israeli agreement, there, unless there are millions of tanks or thousands of tanks uh, held somewhere secretly that I'm not aware of. This is going to have to be resolved politically. But there, Palestinians, of course, perforce have to look for constructive, proactive means of, of pressuring uh, Israel. And I think one of the most heartening developments of late is the ad attitude of the European Union and some European governments like Germany that are essentially um, you know, refusing to cooperate with the occupation anymore, refusing to fund it, refusing to finance it, refusing to um, have anything to do with it. And uh, while they continue to deal with Israel, they won't touch the occupied territories. And this is excellent. And this is something, uh, a, a, a wave and a program and a policy that I think Palestinians could really use to huge effect because it's firmly rooted in international law. The settlements are illegitimate and illegal. Uh, and therefore, their products are illegitimate and illegal. Uh, and it is a way of bringing home to the Israelis that there is an economic cost, a political cost, uh, and a, uh, a, a, a kind of an international isolation cost uh, involved in settlement activity, and also of distinguishing in the Israeli mind, and this is crucial, the difference between Israel, which the Europeans continue to deal with, and the occupation, which the Europeans increasingly will not deal with. And making, dividing that in the minds of ordinary Israelis is key to Palestinian success. And as long as Israelis think that the, you know, the future of the settlements is the same as the future of Tel Aviv, I think the Palestinians are in an impossible situation. If you can break that identification in a thoroughgoing global way through, you know, long-standing friends of Israel in Europe and other major players doing it, now you've got something really to work with that's new. And it's very important. Hussein, you've raised the European angle, and I, I want um, I want Samer to follow up on that. But first, Samer, before you do, I want to read something that uh, is an excerpt from a column that the New York Times writer Tom Friedman wrote about, uh, I guess this is not too long ago, just a few weeks ago in the New York Times. He writes, being here, it's obvious that a third intifada is underway. It's the one that Israel always feared most, not an intifada with stones or suicide bombers, but one propelled by nonviolent resistance and economic boycott. But this third intifada isn't really led by Palestinians in Ramallah. It's led by the European Union in Brussels and other opponents of the Israeli occupation of the West Bank across the globe. Uh, first question emerging from that quote from Tom Friedman's columns. Uh, Sandra, do, how effective do you think this, as he likes to call it, third intifada has been so far? I think, I think it's been tremendously effective, um, and I'm not one to, uh, to frequently agree with Tom Friedman, but I think that, um, you know, it, 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 one could argue um, that there has only been one intifada um, in the occupied Palestinian territories, and it has gone on so long as the Israelis have continued to expand settlements, um, demolish homes, imprison children, uh, and, and, and occupy territories that don't belong to it. Um, whether or not this is called a third intifada or a continuation of a, a daily struggle that Palestinians face uh, throughout the West Bank and Gaza is for someone else to argue. Um, but I, I would have to say that uh, although the Europeans are very much at the vanguard of uh, what's known as the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement, uh, which Hussein referenced, um, what's, what, the reason that movement is so successful is that it originated in Palestine. Um, it, it was, I, I think, something on the order of 170 Palestinian uh, uh, institutions, um, civil society organizations, labor unions, et cetera, that put together the call for, um, for BDS. And so based on that, you've had a tremendous groundswell of support internationally. And the latest manifestation of that is, uh, is of course, um, uh, uh, international objections to Scarlett Johansson's involvement in, in uh, uh, publicizing SodaStream, which is an Israeli company um, that, in fact, has a factory in an Israeli settlement um, in East Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So you take all of that um, to, you know, together, and what you see is uh, a, a very different dynamic now internationally that give, would give the Palestinian Authority um, the, the kind of leverage that it did not have in 1993. Um, if, in fact, you know, they were willing to move beyond what, what Kerry seems to be spoon-feeding them 
um, and, and rely on that kind of international support. And once again, you know, ground the Palestinian cause in, in what it should be grounded in, which is international law and, and the legitimate pursuit of uh, self-determination and human rights. Allah, I don't mean to be facetious about this, but on the one hand, you have what the European Union is doing. On the other hand, as Samara just said, Scarlett Johansson is a pretty popular actress. And you can bet that she's quite a hero to many in the world right now, particularly in the Jewish community, who, thinks, who think rather that she has stood up for an important principle here. Uh, who, who's winning this public relations fight right now? Well, I think um, the BDS is extremely uh, successful and effective. And uh, within all the persistent, actually, uh, bleak and grim political reality, the BDS is actually a source of, of hope and a source of optimism. So I think the effectiveness of the BDS is evident, actually, through the so many uh, successes that actually were achieved quite recently in a very, uh, in a very rapid way that uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing that I lost count of all these uh, successes recently. So, so definitely I would, I would, um, I would say that uh, uh, the BDS, the way it is, it is governed, the way it is led by, as Samer said, by the Palestinian civil society in a, in a, uh, in a bottom-up approach uh, that has the legitimacy actually, is 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 part of the success, and its major pillar is to is to um, is to challenge the occupation. So it is part of of of, of a movement of, of resistance. So um, indeed, it it remains an approach. It remains a technique that need to be contextualized within a bigger uh, uh, a bigger framework for, for resistance. But I would I would argue definitely for its its effectiveness. Uh, and the historical evidence suggests as well that the future will just bring more and more uh, successes. It is, it is effective at the moral level, it is effective at the political level, and recently again at the economic, at the economic level. So the case of the BDS, the civil society-led initiative, is, uh, is keeping in achieving successes. Well, let me go to Hussein with a follow-up here, because on the one hand, Allah talks about successes, on the other hand, there was a, a rather strenuous effort at a BDS campaign in Toronto not too long ago, and it failed rather spectacularly. There is the Scarlett Johansson issue, which has come to the fore, where uh, she has refused to disassociate herself with this water uh, product uh, that comes out of the West Bank. And, and Hussein, let me just read something that Omar Barghouti wrote in the New York Times uh, last month on the BDS campaign, and then I'll get you to comment on that. He writes, the BDS movement's call for full equality in law and policies for the Palestinian citizens of Israel is particularly troubling for Israel because it raises questions about its self-definition as an exclusionary Jewish state. Would justice and equal rights for all really destroy Israel? Did equality destroy the American South or South Africa? Certainly, it destroyed the discriminatory racial order that had prevailed in both places, but it did not destroy the people or the country. Uh, do you think those are useful comparisons? Uh, actually, no. Uh, I think they're deeply misguided. Um, the, the historical, historical analogies are always dangerous. And in this case, I think it's, it's particularly wrong-headed in the sense that the, the, the great successes of the boycott movement that we've been talking about are all based on the illegality of the occupation, the illegitimacy of the settlement movements. But, and, and they've been tremendously successful. And I, I think but placing their success at the feet of, of the groups that issued a call for BDS is, is sort of only half true or maybe even only one-tenth true. They're really driven by European governments and by others around the world who, who have probably not been inspired by those documents or those calls, but by their own sense of, of being fed up with Israel's settlement activities. Now, when you look at efforts to boycott Israel in general, as opposed to boycotting the occupation, which conflates Israel and the occupation, rather than divides Israeli society, and therefore is, is I think, entirely counterproductive, um, uh, you know, you, you can, it's very hard to find successes. There are individual performers or intellectuals who refuse to uh, go to Israel, and uh, one or two instances, but almost every major successful uh, boycott or divestment uh, campaign, particularly in Europe, and they have been spectacularly successful, and we are all in agreement that they're excellent, target <laughs> specifically the occupation because the uh, settlement activity is a strictly uh, prohibited by uh, international law, specifically 
uh, Geneva 4, Article uh, 49, Paragraph 6, and there's no way Israel can deny that. In fact, Israel knows it because in 1967, uh, Theodore Meron wrote them a memo that has been long since leaked saying uh, anything we do in the occupied territories has to be military. If we do anything uh, civilian, it's going to be against the Geneva Convention. The world will see it as, Ill as illegal and illegitimate, and so it is. So if you focus boycotts, as the Europeans are doing, on the occupation, it's going to be enormously successful. But I don't believe that there is a, an appetite in any part of the West, frankly, uh, especially in the United States, but not even in Europe, for a boycott of Israel in general, uh, or a focus of boycotts on equal rights for Palestinian citizens in Israel. I think it's about the occupation. That's where you get success. Well, George, let me ask you a follow-up on that, which is, do you think it's appropriate sure. for Omar Barghouti to make a comparison to the way Palestinian Arabs are treated in Israel today to the way that blacks were treated in the American South uh, 160, 170 years ago. Does that make sense to you? Well, uh, I, I agree with Hussein to the extent that historical analogies are tricky. Uh, and, I, I, you know, there are, there are uh, points of similarity and points of difference between Israel, between the American South, uh, you know, 150 years ago, between Israel and South Africa, all of these uh, places in, in their discriminatory systems um, have both similarities and differences. So uh, I, I, I think comparisons are fair, but have to be carefully drawn. I do want to say something, if you don't mind, Steve, that might bridge our earlier conversation about legitimacy of the Palestinian leadership and the discussion we're now having about BDS and other forms of popular struggle uh, uh, on behalf of Palestinian rights. I do think that there's genuine question as to whether the current Palestinian leadership has either the ability or the willingness to engage in the forms of struggle that will be necessary to achieve Palestinian rights. What will those And one of the be? reasons I think that, I'm, excuse me? You say they'd be Wh unwilling to- Did you to ask which form? Yes, exactly right. Right. Well, for example, they have shown extreme reluctance to, uh, to uh, engage the International Criminal Court in possible prosecutions of Israel for war crimes, uh, of which, by the way, the settlements are an example. Uh, uh, under the Rome Statute. And there are many other, of course, examples of, of uh, arguable, at least, Israeli war crimes in, uh, in Gaza in 2008, 2009, and, and uh, uh, 2012 again. Uh, so uh, I, I, uh, this is just one. Um, and generally speaking, the, you know, since the advent, when the, when the Palestinian leadership returned uh, from uh, the diaspora to the occupied territories in 94, 95, there was a systematic process of essentially taming Palestinian civil society and deactivating it. And um, that uh, process has, uh, has, has continued to, to a certain extent. There have been struggles and, and uh, different ups and downs, but um, the, the, the full uh, creativity and the uh, force of Palestinian civil society has never been joined, has never been uh, joined with the Palestinian leadership. So I, I really think one of the reasons that there won't be an outbreak of, a, of, a, of an intifada uh, shortly after the failure, uh, the impending failure of the talks uh, is that it's going to take some time. It's, there, we need a time of democratic consultation and reevaluation that goes way beyond national reconciliation between the two major political parties. Neither of those parties is truly representative of popular Palestinian imagination. There are many other forces in Palestinian society that have not been incorporated into, uh, into leadership structures, and those processes need time to take place. So I think, you know, we're looking at uh, a few years of, of uh, consideration of possible politi internal political reforms and simultaneously with the survey of these variety of different strategies. But I, I don't think we're going to get very far without some fundamental internal reform. Steve, if I can add to what George just said. Go ahead. I'll, 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 let's actually, get, let's get, just because I know two of you want to respond. So let's go yeah. Allah first and then Hussein after that. Absolutely. Okay. Actually, in addition to what George just said, uh, actually the, the whole structure of the Palestinian Authority, because of the, the, by design, because of Oslo framework, is, is not 
giving the PA the ability to clash with the, with, the, with the occupying power and therefore not to engage in activities, for instance, like the BDS or other, source, other, other sorts of, of resistance. But more crucially, and this is related to the whole legitimacy gap, and as a consequence of Oslo and the other, other, other peace agreement, is the particular aspect of the security collaboration with, with Israel. That is a major source for the eroding legitimacy of the Palestinian Authority. And it was covered by institutional building projects since 2007 in the aftermath of the Palestinian divide until now, uh, what can be called the Biodism. So there was a security uh, sector reform, security campaigns, disarmament processes, that the ultimate consequences of, of this was an authoritarian transformation in the character of the Palestinian Authority. So it's not only unable to, to clash with the occupying power, which is the first and foremost duty of any nation that is under occupation, but also it is disallowing its people and repre rep repressing and oppressing, oppressing them in addition to the oppression of the, of the Israeli authorities. So Palestinians live under multi-layer of oppression, and this is why at the very moment it's very difficult to see a third intifada, intifada happening. But what we, keep, what we need to keep in mind as a rule of thumb is that the the Palestinian society is uh, a social movement society at the end of the day that can, that can revolt any time and, su and surprise us. And as I said, the, the, the first and foremost duty of, of a nation that persists under incubation is to resist it. Hussein. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to say I really strongly agree with, with George in uh, particular that it is essential to open up the Palestinian political space. Civil society Yes, um, he's absolutely right. It, it was very robust historically in the West Bank and in Gaza. In Gaza, it's been completely eliminated. In the West Bank, it's fraying badly and it is, it is in trouble. But even more, the political space, I think he's absolutely right about this, needs opening up. And I think the Palestinians need um, the support of the international community and the regional actors and others to, to do that. In fact, this is absolutely essential. As for the ICC, however, um, I think that he probably is aware uh, that this is an exceptionally difficult and long-term process. If the Palestinians decided to do it, they'd have to try to accede to the Statute of Rome because Israel doesn't, and then they'd have to uh, try to uh, convince the ICC that they are the sovereign uh, power in, the, in Gaza, for example, or any part of the West Bank or something like that, and then they'd have to try to get a prosecutor to take on a case. And it's, it's so contingent. It's really a very complicated, a very time-consuming, and also in, in internationally costly thing to do. So, I mean, I, I think that of all the criticisms I've heard today of, of the uh, PLO, the, the lack of enthusiasm about the ICC is one of the least convincing. When you look at how the process actually would unfold in practice, it, it, it's, it, there, I, I'm not at all convinced that it wouldn't take less than 15 years to even begin to start to get some kind of a prosecution if you went down that route with all the costs involved. Hmm. George, I would just ask you um, before I, we're, we're going to play something, uh, a clip of Yossi Klein Halevi in just a second, but before we get there, mm -hmm. it's ironic that when I've talked to Israelis about this issue, they say some of the same things you just did, uh, namely that they don't find that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the current prime minister of Israel, is particularly representative of Israeli mainstream thought on these issues. And just as there are issues around the um, appropriateness of whether or not Mahmoud Abbas represents mainstream Palestinian thought, they don't think this current Israeli coalition government represents mainstream Israeli thought either. If that's the case, in both camps, you're in a pretty desperate situation, aren't you? Well, uh, I, I think I think that for, first, if you don't mind, I, I do think that Hussein's construal of the road to the ICC is is a little bit overblown. Um, the the current prosecutor of the ICC has publicly stated that she would welcome an application from Palestine, um, and uh, it, you know that's a far cry from a, an actual prosecution. But I I, I do I don't think it's going to be a 15 year process. But now, Steve, to your question, uh, I I. I actually think that Netanyahu is reasonably representative of the Israeli public in its current uh, in its current form and uh, considering its current views. I mean, one thing that I think we have to recognize is that all Israeli governments have promoted settlement activity. Uh, Ehud Barak's 
government promoted very active settlement uh, activity during, you know, during this, the, the Oslo years and the years that we were, you know, supposedly moving toward a two-state solution. So uh, in, in the sense that there seems to be a very strong momentum in the direction of continuing settlement activity and no Israeli government of any stripe has ever slowed it, they have only uh, goosed the gas pedal at one point or another, um, that aspect of Israeli policy seems, seems uh, you know, thoroughly, uh, I mean, that is to say, uh, Netanyahu's position seems thoroughly representative of, of the norm. Um, you know, uh, there are occasional polls which indicate that large numbers of Israelis support a two-state solution, but rarely do those polls, are, are those polls specific about uh, what sacrifices have to be made in order to achieve such a solution. So uh, they're not terribly meaningful. It does not necessarily indicate distance between the Israeli public and, and, uh, and their leadership. Well, on the issue of what sacrifices have to be made, that's a perfect segue to get us to this next clip. Uh, on this program, uh, I guess a few months ago, we had Yossi Klein Halevi, who I'm, I'm sure all of you know, uh, the Israeli uh, thinker, historian, journalist, uh, who has just written a book 10 years in the making called Like Dreamers. And on the issue of the sacrifices both sides have to make if peace is going to be found, he had this to say. Roll tape, please. The tragedy of this conflict is right versus right. And partition, a two-state <clears throat> solution, is not a just solution. It's an unjust solution. It, for, to deprive me of, of, of Judea and Samaria, the biblical names of the West Bank, is unjust. To deprive a Palestinian of Jaffa and Haifa, which is today the state of Israel, is unjust from each of our points of view. The only way we're going to have peace is if we both agree to an un, a mutually unjust solution in which each side loses something vital of its, of its identity, of its being. I, I will not relinquish my claim to the West Bank, my emotional claim, but I need to relinquish my political claim if there's going to be peace, and a Palestinian has to make the same move. Samara, do you think he has characterized this correctly? Well, I, I don't take my cues on what is just and unjust um, from, from an Israeli thinker, much as I, I may or may not respect his writings. Um, I, I think that what matters here is that the facts on the ground make clear that the Israelis have spent the better part of, uh, of four decades um, instituting bypass roads, settlements, and, and, and uh, to date, 500 plus checkpoints throughout the West Bank that are meant to ma maintain a stronghold on that West Bank. Um, from 1993 to 2000, the number of settlers doubled. And again, from 2000 to 2012, it doubled again. And these are according to Israeli statistics, not Palestinian ones. So it, it's quite clear to me that um, whether or not you know, this, is, this is meant to, uh, as a, a just uh, cause or an unjust cause, the Israelis have a very clear um, political imperative here um, that has been borne out on the ground. Now, it's also important to note here that uh, the, the head of the Yesha Council, um, which is to say the largest umbrella organization for, uh, for settlers in the West Bank, a, a fellow by the name of Danny Dayan, who of course is Argentinian born, um, has, has said that any attempt to forge a two-state solution um, uh, between the Israelis and Palestinians was a vain one. Um, and he said this in the New York Times as well, I mean, in an op-ed that was written uh, uh, a couple of years ago. So, you know, it's, it's clear to me that the more than half a million settlers that are in the West Bank have no intention of leaving. Um, it's clear to me that there is an occupier and an occupied, and any sacrifices that the Palestinians have to make are ones that have been forced upon them by that occupying power. Well, Summer, let me and do so, a quick follow-up with you here. Uh, the people who used to yes. live um, in the south of the country, in the Sinai, had no intention of leaving, mm -hmm. But the Israeli Defense Forces went in one day, cleared them out, and a peace with Egypt has now lasted more than 30 years. It's happened before. Why are you so sure it can't happen again? Well, because the Palestinians have never had their right to self-determination. It's one thing to leave the Sinai, um, which is, of course, a piece of land that never belonged to Israel, um, and, and return it to a sovereign nation, uh, i.e. the nation of Egypt. It's another thing altogether to put together a settlement enterprise that's, that's designed to deprive uh, the indigenous people of Palestine of their rights. Um, this is the, 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 it's an entirely different um, situation and circumstance here. Um, in Israel's 65-year history, there has only been a single year 
in 65 years in which the Israeli state has not controlled uh, the, the vast majority of the Palestinian people, which is to say those who live in the occupied Palestinian territories, under an apartheid system. Um, it is an apartheid system because they are, they are deprived of the same rights that, that, um, that their Jewish neighbors have, simply by virtue of the fact that they do not come from the same religion. Um, you know, that, that to me uh, uh, is a clear marker of who is, who is in the right and who is in the wrong here. So to have a just solution, um, we have to begin with, first of all, an acknowledgement um, of that injustice, an acknowledgement that what exists today is in fact apartheid, um, and any negotiation must begin from that. It must begin from you know, the, 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 the reality that the Palestinian cause is a just one, first and foremost. Well, Hussein, I guess the, the flip side of that would be the Israelis are not going to recognize whatever just, legitimate concerns Palestinians have until Palestinians acknowledge the reality that Israel's a Jewish state and wants to remain one as part of a two-state solution. Uh, uh, comment on that, if you would. Uh, yeah, I mean, let me just say about what Yossi Klein Halevi was saying. Uh, if I, th I think he, he characterized it rather well, although and it, it's, it's unusual for me to agree with him, but I'm, I'm, I'm heartened to hear him say, uh, you know, that he felt he had to give up any political claim, Israeli political claim, on the occupied territories. Now, you know, as far as, far as the Jewish state thing goes, it, it is um, really a remarkable thing for a country to ask another people to define itself. This is unheard of in international relations. And of course, 20% of the citizens uh, of the State of Israel, most of whom are Palestinians uh, of this 20%, are not, are not classified as Jewish. They don't self-identify as Jewish. And the Israel, which categorizes every citizen according to nationality, which is another category than citizenship, and there are over a hundred of these. Jewish is one, Arab is another, and then there are uh, about a hundred more little ones. In order for uh, discriminatory uh, practices to be maintained of land, especially regarding housing and, and land and where people live, and from that extrapolates a whole bunch of other um, forms of discrimination. But I mean, the, the, uh, the, the basic idea that, that it is essential that Palestinians recognize Israel as a Jewish state was not ever heard of until 2007. As soon as we had this demand from 1948 on uh, for the Palestinians and all the Arabs recognize Israel. In 1993, the PLO recognized Israel. Israel recognized the PLO as the representative of the Palestinian people, but they did not then and never have recognized the Palestinian right to statehood, let alone a Palestinian state. So we've had over 20 years of unrequited, if you want to take a two-state solution as, as the correct one, one side has recognized the other state, and the other side has not only not recognized the other state or allowed it to come into existence, they haven't recognized formally in any major, you know, serious, committed way, the, even the right to have that state. And suddenly, in 2007, this issue was brought up at Annapolis, and both the Palestinians and Americans treated it with disdain. It went away. When Netanyahu was re-elected prime minister for the second time in, in 2009, he made this the hallmark of his, uh, of his government until now. And he has pushed on this issue so hard that he has said this is not only an issue, it is the only issue. It is, he said it many times, this is the only real issue. Now, I mean, how could it be the only real issue and it never occurred to any Israeli until 2007 to even mention it? Uh, I really think it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a very damaging thing to add on to an already overburdened process new demands which have very serious consequences. And let me just say this. Israel itself does not define what it means by Jewish state. It calls itself a Jewish state. But it does, they, there, last year in the Knesset, there were a couple of bills to try to define what Jewish state meant, and they all fell apart. They, none of them made it past first reading because no one in Israel can agree what Jewish state means. So Palestinians are being asked to agree to something that Israelis can't explain to them what it is. This, this really is a red herring, and it should, if we can drop it, the sooner the better. Uh, maybe there needs to be some kind of language about self-determination for people and their citizens in different states. We could have something like that. But okay, let me come back with this. Uh, Allah, um if we're talking red herrings, I think Israeli supporters would say this business of calling Israel an apartheid state is another one of those things. And they would say the following. They would say, this is going to Allah, this question. Um, they would say, the 20% of Palestinian Arabs who live in Israel, if by some chance peace were to happen tomorrow and a Palestinian state existed in the West Bank and Gaza, 
Leave the details aside for now. Do you think that 20% who are living in this so-called apartheid state would stay where they are or would they move to Palestine? I've spoken to Palestinian journalists who have said they'd stay right where they are right now because they got it better in Israel than they ever would in the West Bank. What's your view on that, Allah? Well, they will stay wherever they are because it's their homeland, because this is where they were born and this is, this is, this is their life. So they are, not, they are staying there not because Israel is offering them better life, but it is because of the right of self-determination. It's because of the right to stay wherever they want and wherever they have the right to stay. And they are not the only one who need to stay there, but also the other refugees and other and the Palestinian refugees in the other neighboring countries and in the world. According to international law, they also have the right to go back to what it's called now cover Israel. So it's it's I don't think it's a matter of, of question if we're talking here about concessions and what are the what are the prices, they have the right to stay wherever they are. Okay. Let's, everybody remembers Moshe Ahrens, the former Likud Minister of Defense and Foreign Affairs. He wrote the following last year in the Israeli newspaper Haaretz on the issue of what kind of risk are we willing to take. He says, leave forever large swaths of Judea and Samaria and uproot tens of thousands of Israelis from their homes or plan on incorporating into Israel parts of Judea and Samaria and accept the Arab population there as citizens of Israel. He doesn't call it a one-state solution. Uh, Samir, I'll go to you first on this. He calls it a binational state. <laughs> um, regardless of what label you want to put on it, do you find it odd to see an Israeli, I, th I think a guy whose right-wing bona fides are pretty well established, opting for what appears to be a less demographically Jewish Israel? Well, I, I think, first of all, Steve, um, in that very op-ed, uh, Moshe Ahrens puts the word occupation in quotation marks. Um, he refers to the West Bank as Judea and Samaria. Um, he makes no acknowledgment of the fact that uh, Jewish Israeli settlers don't belong there in the first place. Um, and he goes on to condone the, the, the very system that, that he hopes to get rid of uh, by, by coming up with the binational state that he doesn't name. Um, so I, I think the, the, the premise that he begins with is a flawed one. Um, again. I don't think, as a Palestinian whose own mother is a refugee and has no hope of returning to her native Bethlehem, that any just peace can begin with anything other than an acknowledgement that it, uh, in 1948, there was a foreign population that displaced an indigenous population, and that has been the core of the problem ever since. Um, I, I, don't think, I don't think that uh, the way the settlements are set up today in the West Bank, there is any hope that those who live in Modain Elite, for example, which is one of the, la the largest settlements in the West Bank, in fact, I think the largest, um, and is the subject of, uh, your, your viewers may know, the Oscar-nominated film Five Broken Cameras, um, I, don't, I don't think that there's any foreseeable future where they're going to be sharing their lives and their resources and their wealth with the Palestinians who live at the bottom of the hill and whom they have deprived of every conceivable resource um, that, that is native to, the, to their land in the first place. Um, so whatever that solution may look like in Moshe Aaron's mind, it is not one that, that I'm apt to uh, accept as a Palestinian. Understood. All right, in our remaining moments here, let me play you one more piece of tape here. Uh, we talked about the Yossi Klein Halevi interview earlier. A couple of weeks ago on this program, we had Ari Shavit on. Uh, the author, the historian, who's written a book called My Promised Land, which has gained a great deal of attention around the world. Uh, Samar, I have to say, one of the things he acknowledges is that the original settlers, I guess when I say original, I mean in the uh, late uh, 19th century, uh, who came to Israel did not see the Palestinians who were already there. They weren't called Palestinians uh, at the time, but there were Arabs in the land, and he acknowledges they did not see them. They had dreams of recreating a homeland, and therefore, they did not see the people who were already there. He acknowledges that. Having said that, he goes on. Let's play this clip, and then we'll get some reaction afterwards. Roll tape, please. We have to acknowledge. It's our duty to acknowledge the tragic past. But it's the Palestinians' duty to overcome it. Because in a sense, what I say to the Palestinians is, yes, I acknowledge that you went through terrible suffering and terrible pain. They call it the catastrophe, but, 1948. Yes, but one has to do two things. One is to put it in context. And the context is that the 1940s were brutal throughout the world. Now, I describe the tragedy of Lida, the Palestinian city of Lida. Dresden was much worse than Lida. And no one says 
the, the Britain is illegitimate because of Dresden. So, so, so the 1940s, the war, and after the war, after the war, you had millions of refugees throughout Europe, in, in India and Pakistan. So the Palestinians should not be addicted to their sense of victimhood. If they are into the victimhood game, you know, no one can beat the Jews in the victimhood game. No one can compete with us on that. So let them learn in this sense from what the way we overcame our tragic past. Our past was so tragic and yet we did not be let the past poison ourselves. And we did choose life and we did choose moving forward. George, the um I guess the allegation here is it's time to get over it. It's time to stop reveling in the victimhood of the Palestinian cause. How does that sound to you? It sounds ironic uh, for a representative of a people who uh, I don't think would, would take well to being told to get over the Holocaust, for example. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think you know, if, if Palestinians were to take their lesson for, from Zionism, that would mean that they would go and expropriate some other people and take some other people's land in, in order to set up their, their homeland. That's nonsense. That's not the way to achieve justice. That's not the way to achieve peace. That's not the way to move on. The way to move on is to acknowledge what has happened, to come to grips with what has happened, to repair the damage that has been done and uh, not, not to uh, pretend that this is just a kind of a, an unfortunate accident of history as has, uh, as has happened to other people and we therefore uh, move on. Hussein, um, I, I really don't mean this as a smart ass facetious question. So okay. with, with that um, caveat in place, are there days you wake up and you say to yourself, Sam, I just wish we'd accepted the partition plan 67 years ago and we'd have our bloody state today. Um, you know, I, I think that that occurs to many friends of the Palestinians and many Palestinians um, probably frequently, although the, the fact is no, no people would have agreed to it. It was, a, it was ridiculously one-sided because there wasn't going to be a Jewish majority in the Jewish state that was being partitioned. There was no area of mandatory Palestine in 1947 that had a Jewish majority. This, it, was, it was in preparation for further immigration, and it really was so enormously unfair on the majority population that I think even though wisdom probably, you know, in hindsight certainly, would say should have taken that deal because it's been downhill all the way since then, but, but the fact of the matter is no people would have agreed to have their country chopped up around them against their will when they were at least 75 percent of the population. They would, it's asking too much of a people, I think, um, to see it that way. And but with regard to Ari Shavit and also uh, Yossi Klein Halevi and, all, and, and, and Moshe Ahrens in particular, it, it really has to be said there is no conflict ending solution including annexationism, partial annexationism, or anything like that, that the Israeli right may dream of, that is going to be conflict ending. It can just change the terms of the conflict. But let's say Israel did annex a chunk of the West Bank that it wants and try to fob off the rest on Jordan or just leave it you know, in Gaza-like state or something, the, 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 the um, struggle would continue elsewhere, from Gaza, from other parts of the occupied territories. It will not end unless you have two states and that is the only way out uh, and Israeli annexationists are among the most deluded people in this entire conflict. George I am literally down to my last 30 seconds here a long enough period of time to ask you the following do you think this is going to be resolved in your lifetime? Yes I think it will be resolved within two to three decades. Two to three decades? Mm -hmm. yes. I agree. Yeah, I don't. I don't think we're on the on the horizon of uh, of a solution. I think we I think we have some decades of work to do, and some struggle to do. Uh, but I do think it will be resolved in my lifetime. Uh, I, I don't know how old you are, George, but that presumes, I guess, that you're going to get close to a hundred to see this day. Well, I'm I'm 59. Okay, so if it <laughs> all right. So you, let's hope you live to 90 and see this day, as, as the expression goes I hope so. from your lips to God's ears. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for participating in this discussion tonight. Uh, Ala Tartir, the program director of Al Shabaka, the Palestinian Policy Network in London, via Skype. 
George Basharat, the professor of law at the University of California Hastings College of the Law in Berkeley, California. Hussein Ibish, good to see you again, Hussein, the senior fellow at the American Task Force on Palestine in Washington, D.C. via Skype. And Samir Bardawi, the writer and Middle East analyst who came to us out of New York City today. Good to have you all on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.